This week, join me as I explore the rise and fall of central Mexico's city of the gods, Teotihuacan, a metropolis of mega proportions that thrived for centuries, then mysteriously collapsed. Who built Teotihuacan and what happened to them? To find out, I float above the ruins, play one of the world's oldest sports, <laughs> make razor sharp tools with volcanic glass, and learn about one man whose bones become my window into the past. It's a search for answers to one of history's great enigmas. We're digging for the truth, and we're going to extremes to do it. Like butter. These are the ruins of Teotihuacan. At one point, this was a thriving cultural center. Some believe this was the first great city of the Western Hemisphere. But after centuries of dominance, it suddenly collapsed. Its inhabitants left us no readable documents to explain why. Just their monuments, their art, and their graves. Hi, I'm Josh Bernstein, and I've come here to central Mexico to explore the fate of this city's people. And there's no better place to start than with the ruins of the city itself. Pyramids dominate the city skyline. Today, three major ones still stand. But in the past, as many as 200 smaller pyramids, all just a few feet from each other, dotted the city. Construction started in the first century AD. At its height, around 450 AD, almost 150,000 people lived here, in specially designed apartment complexes. The city stretched out for some 20 square miles, making it one of the ancient world's largest cities. Then, sometime after 550 AD, the city was suddenly abandoned, with no records left to explain what happened. Teotihuacan is located some 30 miles from modern-day Mexico City. It's easy to confuse the Teotihuacanos with the Maya or the Aztecs. But the Maya, who lived hundreds of miles away, were culturally and ethnically distinct from Teotihuacan. The Aztecs, on the other hand, may have descended from the Teotihuacanos. They were the ones who discovered the silent ruins of the city some 700 years after its collapse. the superhuman majesty of the ruins so profoundly impressed them that they immortalized it in their legends. They named this monumental city Teotihuacan, the city of the gods. Today, it's the most visited archeological site in Mexico, but is still one of the least understood. Who built Teotihuacan? I'm here at the on-site museum with Dr. Mike Spence. He's conducted extensive excavations at Teotihuacan. His specialty, analyzing human remains. Mike introduces me to some of the earliest inhabitants, or at least what's left of them. Clues like these have given him insight into the city and its people. When we found these, these revolutionized our understanding of Teotihuacan. We had the idea that Teotihuacan was primarily peaceful. But when we found these, we realized that there was a more sinister aspect to the city. Um, these particular individuals are soldiers, we believe. Mike, how do you know that these guys were soldiers? You can see that they're wearing these shell collars, and below the collars, hanging from them, are a series of, of replicas of human jawbones. The ones here are replicas because this is a museum, or they actually were buried with replicas? No, they were buried with replicas. Oh, really? Replicas meant to symbolize or represent the uh, various kills they made in warfare. So each jaw represents one or a certain number of people they've killed? I think so. Judging from the number of jawbone pendants, we can tell that they were clearly elite soldiers but a closer examination of their remains could tell me a lot more about them and their civilization. Mike takes me to a storeroom, 
stacked from floor to ceiling with ancient remains found at the site. Is that it? Well, there's more in other aisles. Got anything in a size 11? We go on a treasure hunt of sorts. Here's another one. And stack up on the bones of one man who lived here some 2,000 years okay. ago. I'll carry this one. Okay. First. He's a critical source of information. Uh, this is like a really scary Christmas yeah. present. <laughs> What'd you get me? You can catch. I'm gonna give him something. To Grab that one. <laughs> That's the femur. Femur. Go. The other femur. Ah, I got you. Ah, the tibia. Ah, very good. There you go. We lay the bones out like you'd expect him to be buried. But this wasn't the way his bones were actually found. Put this out like this a little bit, okay. and then these would come back in, sort of flexing the legs, okay. you know? Like and and that's how the legs were, close together and bent. Mm -hmm. yeah. His bent position tells us that he was bound at the feet. And that's not all. Okay. Now the wrists, they would have looked like this, only they would have been underneath have been behind the pelvis. The pelvis right? yeah. So was it like, was it like this, where they're actually? That's what, right. Yeah, a little height? higher, about Here? the small of the back. Yeah. And in this case, the cause of death was. I think he was probably buried alive. Buried alive, along with two hundred other healthy young people, all sacrificed in a single, seemingly gruesome event. Who were these victims? Fortunately. Bones and teeth store chemical records of oxygen isotopes. These act like geographic markers, allowing us to find out more about these people. Nearly all of the oxygen that goes into the formation of tooth and bone comes from the water we drink. The oxygen isotopes in bones change when a person moves from one place to another. By analyzing these isotopes, scientists can tell where the person lived before he died. The bone told us that he'd been living in Teotihuacan for some years before he was sacrificed. On the other hand, oxygen isotopes in teeth don't change over time. They're imprinted by water we drink in childhood, when our teeth are forming. By comparing these isotopes to those in the water in various places, Mike can tell that this soldier wasn't born here. And the isotopes in the tooth mm -hmm. indicates that he spent his childhood someplace else, not in Teotihuacan, not even near Teotihuacan. How far away? Could have been Highland Guatemala, and that's a thousand or more kilometers away. It could have been Michoacan, which is still two to three hundred kilometers away. So his story, he was born a long distance away, probably Highland Guatemala, arrived at some point in Teotihuacan, became a member of the military, served in Teotihuacan for some years, and then was sacrificed. The other victims have a similar story. Most of them were born elsewhere and moved to Teotihuacan later in life. This suggests that the rulers recruited people from diverse regions of Mesoamerica before sacrificing them at the altar of the state. Isn't that a testament then to the power of Teotihuacan. Yes. So this city had quite an allure. It tells us that this was the premier city of Mesoamerica. So, that, so Teotihuacan was known far and wide it was. for being special. It, it was more than special. It wasn't just an ordinary city, not even an extraordinary city. It was absolutely unique. It was the city where, where time began, where the present universe was formed, where the gods sacrificed themselves to make men. Risking their lives on the battlefield wasn't all that was asked of these soldiers. The state even demanded the ultimate sacrifice at times of peace. Who ordered the death of these people? How did they make this state so attractive that immigrants from so far away gave up their lives for it? Coming up, in search of answers, I take to the sky and plunge deep into a hidden passage beneath a giant pyramid. Getting smaller. I'm on a quest to find out who built the city of the gods. 
I've examined their bones and found some pretty grisly evidence of sacrifice. Now, I'm heading to see their monuments to learn more about the city. The scale and magnificence of Teotihuacan has long perplexed archaeologists and scientists. The epic architecture and organization suggest a strong central authority. I've asked Linda Manzanilla, a leading archaeologist in Teo, to tell me more about the city's design. Do you know when people first settled here? We have traces of villages towards the southern part of the valley around 400 before Christ. But the beginning of the construction was around 80 AD. Okay. And then we think that there was an elite who planned the city as a model of the Mesoamerican cosmos. So this city was always designed to be something significant? Yes, it seems as it was very planned from the beginning. I learned that the visionary elite responsible for the early stages of construction planned this city in such detail that it's still one of the most impressive examples of city planning in human history. To get a full grasp of this city's scale, Linda tells me I have to get another point of view. All right, up, up, and away. To get to the ancient city of Teotihuacan from here, I have to fly above the modern one. For the wind. <laughs> yeah. The captain just told me that if we stay low, the wind will take us right over the pyramids. If we go high, it's going to come back this way. Wind direction shifts with altitude. Buenos dias. Saludes, saludes con la mano. Buenos dias. Around 45,000 people live in the Teotihuacan municipality today. It was a bit voyeuristic. That's not even a third the number who lived here 2,000 years ago. But the way in which this modern city is laid out seems much more haphazard than the ancient one. I was impressed by the size of the city from the ground. But from up here, what I see is a testament to the complexity and sophistication of the people who designed and built this city. I've learned from Linda that the architects of Teotihuacan had something very precise in mind when they laid the city out. We've got the Avenue of the Dead running north-south. At this end, what we call today the Pyramid of the Moon. We don't know what they actually called it back then. And then over here on the east side is the Pyramid of the Sun. Here we can see the avenue. You see, there's, there's a line. Imagine a line going from the Pyramid of the Sun due west. And that crosses the Avenue of the Dead heading north-south. This quadrangle is how archaeologists believe that this city was laid out to a master plan. There's something more to this grid plan than meets the eye. Apparently, every wall, every street going north-south is angled exactly the same. Bearing just shy of true north, they're all angled at 15 degrees, 25 minutes east. The significance of this orientation? It's still a mystery. It's really obvious from up here that nothing in this site is accidental or random. Everything was designed with a purpose. It's as if the rulers wanted their pyramids to compete with the surrounding mountains. The scale and size of the pyramids were perhaps assurance that the elite were so powerful that they can now rival the gods themselves. What else do we know about these rulers and their imperial city? I head back to rejoin Linda Manzanilla, who wants to take me to a place where most people aren't allowed to go. I would like you to wear this. Okay. It's, it's a tunnel that goes like a serpent towards the center of the pyramid, and it's like the uh, entrance to the underworld. Oh, fun. Yeah. Linda is taking me under the Pyramid of the Sun, one of the biggest pyramids in the world. It rises as high as a 20-story building and is filled in with about three million cubic tons of dirt and rubble. Ah, so this, is this the entrance here? No, no, that's a tunnel made by the archeologist. We should go inside this one. The tunnel we're entering is the only one made by the ancients that's been found so far. But Linda thinks there may be other hidden tunnels. She wants to show me how they're trying to find these and why they may be important. There we go. With hard hats for protection, we descend into the tunnel. Should be fine. Oh, 
Linda believes that this shaft was created by removing loose volcanic rocks from the ground. The resulting serpentine tunnel heads down for 300 feet. Tight squeeze, humid, and uh, I can definitely feel the sensation of going down, down into the center of the pyramid. Over the centuries, this tunnel has been looted many times. All that's left of the original interior are a few stone channels that collected the water dripping from the ceiling. A hidden tunnel or chamber would be a real prize for the archaeologists. It could hold secret treasures that offer clues to some of this city's riddles. It's getting hard to breathe. To penetrate the hidden secrets of the pyramid, scientists are using the latest technological tool. Got yes. something huge and white in the center of the... Oh yes, this ice. is a muon detector. It's an instrument uh, that we are using to see if, if, if there are chambers that the archaeologists have not seen inside the pyramid. A muon detector. Muon detector, yes. Wow. The muon detector is like a huge x-ray machine. It tracks muons, subatomic particles. Just like dental x-rays find cavities in teeth, the muon detector finds cavities in the pyramid above. Most muons get absorbed by the mass of the pyramid and don't reach the detector. But in spots where there are holes or chambers, more muons pass through to the machine where they're recorded and mapped. As for the tunnel, this is where it ends, in four chambers, which Linda says may have represented the four quadrants of the city above. Who knows what clues may have been in these chambers before it was looted? The muon detector will hopefully help improve our knowledge. But it'll take at least another year to measure the muons and work out if there are any hidden chambers. So until then... We'll just let it do its thing. <laughs> Up next, I travel to an ancient volcanic glass mine in search of more clues Very to good. this mysterious mm -hmm. civilization. Oh, because it might collapse? It might collapse. Oh. In search of clues about the inhabitants of the City of the Gods, I found out about mass sacrifices and possible hidden chambers under the state temple. Okay. From above, I saw real evidence that this was a true metropolis. It was a city with a multi-ethnic population, ruled by a mysterious elite. How did this city become so grand? What was it that propelled it to greatness? You're going to need this. Okay. And we have a flashlight, okay. so let's go. All right. I'll grab I'm my shovel. I'm here with Ken Hurth, an anthropologist like and plan. expert on Mesoamerican commerce. He tells me that the source of their power wasn't gold or right, diamonds. Well, it'll be dry it was a mind. substance called obsidian volcanic glass. It's hard to imagine that this was the great wealth that propelled the rise of Teotihuacan. So Ken's going to show me what this material was all about and why this versatile stone was the steel of Mesoamerica. Now be careful going down. It's been raining a lot, so it'll be slippery. Ken's taking me to an area where obsidian has been mined since the days of Teotihuacan. Now we're going in, so be careful. It's been raining a lot, and we don't want to have roof collapse. Okay, yeah. That would not be good. This ancient mine was converted into a modern shaft, and it's still mined today. Ken explains that the roof is completely unsupported. Recent rains have soaked the ground and weaken the walls. Just two days ago, a tunnel collapsed. And that's not something we want to happen while we're inside. Hopefully, the miner's prayer candle will offer us some protection. The miners dig until they find a vein of obsidian, mm -hmm. and then they'll follow the vein, uh, taking out the nodules that they can, uh, they can find. Be careful, it's really tight here. Uh, I like it that way. Ken and I are now a long way in. Yeah, we can no longer idea. see the mouth of the tunnel. But we've asked some of the miners to wait near the entrance, just in case something happens. Yeah, Josh, here's a good spot. All right. 
Oh wow, look at that. Yeah, you can you can see the natural obsidians embedded in a, uh, a soil ash matrix. Wow, there's obsidian everywhere. Look at this. So this was gold, but to them obsidian. This was, this was the valuable stuff, yeah. Right. So let's just yeah. uh, see if we can find a good quality piece. Uh -huh. Can we take a piece from like up here? Would that be unwise? Uh, we could, but uh, the roof might collapse. We're better off <laughs> looking. Okay. Yeah, uh, let's uh, focus on the floor. Yeah, fo focus on the floor. Okay. And what is it that we're looking for? What makes one piece of obsidian better than another? Well, the quality of the glass. No inclusions or veins, because that makes it easier to flake. Uh, and that's what the people at Teotihuacan would have been looking for. Might be good. This one here? That one is very good. Yeah? Let's just test it and see what quality glass it is. How do you test it? Uh, I've got a little hammer stone. If we just uh, knock off a couple flakes. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, that is good quality glass. All right, that one's mine. Okay. This may be another good quality piece here. Okay. Yeah, it looks like pretty good glass. So I've got one. I'll take this one. Ken says that there's something Back special the about this obsidian, but we need to get a good look at it in the light. Outside the mine, uh, there's a debris area where miners have left their rejects. The pieces, you'll see that what makes this obsidian But unique, even the rejects carry uh, the hallmark in, of what makes so this, this obsidian unique. You'll see that it uh, has a green golden sheen to it, wow, look at that. which uh, was important to pre-Hispanic people. They thought green stone was alive, and so it had a symbolic importance. Uh, whether it was a green obsidian or jade, it was uh, symbolically important to them. This green uh, quality obsidian you won't find in any other obsidian in Mexico or anywhere in the New World. It only occurs here. So if anyone had a green obsidian blade, it came from here. It came from here. See the, uh, All right. the old shafts. Let's go in. One of the secrets to Teotihuacan's success was their control of this source of rare green obsidian. But the city was also surrounded by two other huge obsidian deposits and several small ones. The raw materials and tools found in various stages of production at Teo show that every aspect of obsidian manufacture was controlled by the city. Well, let's just, Ken uh, and I head to a nearby campsite and where he and other archaeologists do their field work. He wants to show me how to shape obsidian into the tools of the era and demonstrate the unusual qualities of this stone. What we want to shape is uh, something like this. It's called a macro core, mm -hmm. and it's uh, made by percussion flaking mm -hmm. and has a, a flat platform that we take our flakes off of. Okay. What we'd like to produce are nice parallel sided uh, ridges. This is what we want to create. And this is what we're starting That's with. what we're starting with. Okay, right. show me how. Okay. Hammerstone. Hammerstone in hands. Tricky, tricky, tricky. Yeah. Yeah, Creating a core is oh, standard oh, flint napping right, procedure, back, right. but napping or obsidian okay, is so tricky. Can I just come in hard and heavy right here and, <laughs> and see Pro if I can Probably it? not. It flakes off very easily. If you're not careful, huge chunks would break off, and you'd be left with a lot of useless bits. And I don't that want that. Yeah. That's good. good. That's a good one. Yeah, just like that, all the way around. To learn flint napping, you gotta break a lot of rock. Once they have a percussion core like this, they use these ridges to start making blades. Okay. This, is a, this is a Teotihuacan finished core, mm -hmm. and what you can see are all the parallel ridges are the uh, spots where uh, blades came off. Mm -hmm. Looks like this. So, so one of the things that the Teotihuacan of flint nappers were making with long skinny blades like this. Long skinny blades. Mm -hmm. They would have basically... The Teotihuacanos would have braced themselves between trees or stumps. But Ken has created this portable rig. Holding the core with his feet, he has to apply just the right amount of pressure. It takes skill and precision. Something that Ken has developed over many, many hours of hard practice. Good one. Nice. Oh, that's great. This core ah. is a blade factory. You can flake off blade after blade from it. Okay. You can see where they came off the core. And that's wow. just what the Teotihuacanos did. That's great. And we know that they made these, right? Right. These right. replicate exactly what archaeologists have found. Exactly. Yep. 
Archaeologists have found Teotihuacan green obsidian tools all over Mesoamerica, in sites thousands of miles away. This obsidian trade was key in making Teotihuacan the economic center of Mesoamerica. Traders and craftsmen carried these cores to distant towns and flaked off blades on the spot for their customers. The city not only controlled the export of obsidian, it also controlled the human skill it took to shape it. And that skill was vital. The, they were a Stone Age society, they didn't have metal. Uh, they manufactured all their cutting edge from obsidian, which is the sharpest cutting edge you know, that you can manufacture, uh, even sharper than surgical stainless steel. Sharpest edge you can manufacture even today? Even today. Uh, that's so cool. I want to explain what's going on here. Some of the local miners have actually brought in a goat, which they're going to prepare for dinner. But I want to make a point using obsidian. The reason why obsidian blades were found all over Mesoamerica is because everyone had to eat and everyone needed a knife. Obsidian was the most important tool when it came to processing. This is what puts the meat on the table. They would use the obsidian blades for, for weaponry, and, and then also they used it for ceremonial activities. They would let their own blood to give it to the gods, and so a small lancelet, they could pierce their tongue or their ears and draw blood and, and uh, then offer it as an offering to the gods. Blood was sacred. Wow, so this is practical, ceremonial, and sacred. Why not let these guys come in and take their goat back? Gracias! Teotihuacan's control of this versatile substance made them an economic powerhouse. Their sphere of influence extended well beyond their borders. Coming up, I decode the city's frescoes and play one of the oldest sports in the world to solve the mystery of the city of the gods. I'm trying to piece together the story of Teotihuacan. I've seen a master-planned metropolis and evidence of mass human sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Now I've oh, discovered boy, that, that a unique cool. Stone Age technology was the source of its power. Obsidian made Teotihuacan the dominant culture in the region. But how did this concentration of wealth and authority impact its citizens? To find out, we have to go to an apartment complex on the site. Some 300 years after Teo was established, city planners shifted the emphasis from the construction of monumental architecture to the construction of more than 2,000 residential compounds in the city. I'm back with Mike Spence, and he tells me that in its prime, around 450 AD, close to 150,000 people lived in Teotihuacan. That's a residence. People would have been eating and sleeping and living in here. To accommodate them, these apartments were designed and built on a scale unprecedented in history. This is absolutely unique. Mesoamerica hasn't seen anything like this before, and this wasn't practiced anyplace else in Mesoamerica at this time. Is there any way to know if, like, if this was a major switch for the living lifestyles of these people? I suspect the state had to use a little bit of muscle to get people into these. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see it is sort of state design. There's commonalities in all of them that suggest that. So here, this is, this is a residence? That's a residence. By forcefully relocating the people into government housing, the ruling elite tightened their grip on daily life. But the social engineering didn't stop there. Political indoctrination was incorporated into the decor of every home. And that is my next clue. Teotihuacan may have had a written language, but scholars haven't been able to decipher it yet. So another way we can learn about this society is by studying the art and artifacts they've left behind. I'm now heading to an apartment complex here on the site to meet an art historian, and I'm hoping she can tell me more about this civilization. Her name is Kim so Goldsmith. This, this, this She's been studying the mural art in Teotihuacan for more than 15 years. She says that the artwork is as well-planned as the architecture of the city. It sure did, we stop at a recurring icon, fabulous. an image of a priest. Aren't these fabulous? So what can these tell us about the people of Teotihuacan? Well, we could learn a lot more if we had more. We probably have about 1.1% of their mural artwork remaining. But in general, the mural paintings of Teotihuacan are really representing state symbolism as 
trying to be really a state propaganda. Even in your own house, on the inside of your house, you're not allowed to pick what you're going to put on your walls. You are going to have a state mandated theme inside your house. So it's visually mesmerizing everybody into saying, we're the greatest, we're the best, go team. Really? So there's some sort of programming going on through yes, the murals? Yes, definitely. And it works. It works very, very well. The mural art was like a political campaign for the elite. Archaeologists believe these ornate drawings of high priests, ritual, and sacrifice were painted on the walls in every single home in the city, burning their message into the minds and the hearts of their people. It's as if the murals were used to impose the will of the state on every individual. Was this the climate in which the sacrificed soldiers lived? A climate where they might have accepted that they'd one day give their lives up for the state. Kim takes me around the corner to see another mural. She thinks this room might have been a school. They're really beautiful. What we saw down there. It's very different because this is more of a slice of everyday life. These are men playing all different kinds of games that I'm sure they must have played during, during the time period of the city. Looks like here they're playing bocce or marbles or something. Yeah, some kind using, of a ball game. And, using balls, yeah. And you have a fellow getting a piggyback ride <laughs> okay, yeah. right here. And, Oh, here's another plane. This ball is there. very interesting. These two fellows are playing. Here's the ball. It looks like they're playing using their hips without being able to touch it with their hands. It looks like they're going to a lot of trouble to avoid touching it, in fact. Maybe it has even a continuance in modern times today, some relative of it. What game? There is a game where they play it in a court like this? Some people play a game like it, very much so. Everything in the City of the Gods had a religious or ritual aspect. If the rest of this culture is any indication, the game probably wasn't child's play. To find out if this game can offer me more insights into this imperial culture, I travel to western Mexico, where the game is still being played. Here, I meet Ricardo Urquijo, a local who knows a lot about the game, called Hip Ulama. So this is the game, huh? Yeah, this is Ulama. They're using a taste, which is the field ground. Mm -hmm. And here you have this line, which is in, right in the middle, and it's called analco. When they uh, cannot respond, then that's a point for this team. It's a bit like volleyball. Each team tries to hit the ball back to the other side. Except, of course, here, they're using their hips instead of their hands. And how many points until you win? Eight. The game has a history dating back before the Aztecs, and even before the Teotihuacanos, stretching back some 4,000 years. Ken, is it okay if I give it a try? Sure. Yeah. Va a probar Josh con ustedes, muchachos. Okay? okay. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Well, you guys have your shoes off. Bring it on! That's to me. Ah. Ow. <laughs> Learning to play ulama is all about learning to flick your hips. That and getting hit by an eight-pound ball. I'll tell you one thing, when the ball hits you, you can feel it. It's heavy, and it's just like a massive amount of rubber, and I'm gonna have a, a nice bruise to play, but it's fine. This is seemingly playful stuff, an innocent ball game. But it turns out it wasn't innocent at all. This game between competing teams may have symbolized the battle between the gods in the sky and the lords of the underworld. The ball itself may have symbolized the sun. The rulers of Teotihuacan took a physical game and turned it into a supernatural ritual. Once again, the heavy hand of the state made its mark on daily life. So Ricardo, any sense of how the rules or the game has changed over the last 2,000 years? They have changed a lot because uh, in Teotihuacan days, the winner was uh, sacrificed to the gods. To have fertility, good crops, rain. So you'd, you'd want to die through yes. this game? Yes. Right. Because to me, as someone who's playing now, like I, I would think the loser would die. 
You know? <laughs> right. It's like, we beat you, you die. You yeah. know? But you're saying that actually it was the honor of the winning team right. to be sacrificed right. in one of right. the highest ways possible. Yes, of course. Okay, did we win or lose? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope I lost. Uh... I'm glad to be going back unharmed. Well, mostly. But I've learned something. In Teotihuacan, the dominance of the state was so complete that for centuries people were asked to give up their lives for it in war and in peace. Coming up, what happens when the state doesn't keep its end of the bargain? I'm trying to understand the mysterious city of Teotihuacan. I've crawled into volcanic glass mines examined human bones, and played one of the world's oldest sports. Once, people gave up their lives for this all-powerful state. But no city can last forever. It's time to explore how it fell. A vital clue is found in an unlikely substance. Lime. When originally constructed, each pyramid was plastered with lime, which was then beautifully painted by artists. Elizabeth Soyero, a scientist who's studying the impact Teotihuacan had on its environment, is exploring a theory that's becoming increasingly What's popular. Going on here? This is an oven where the Teotihuacans uh, produced lime, lime to plastic the pyramids. So how do you make lime? Does it need a lot of wood? They need it a lot, yeah. Lime is really just burnt and powdered limestone mixed with water. And to make lime from scratch, I'd have to keep this kiln burning at 800 degrees for at least eight hours. That would take a lot of wood. Back in the day, the city was surrounded by thick forests. When the Teotihuacans started to live here, the, all the mountain was plenty of, of uh, pines. If we were here 2,000 years ago, there were trees here, mm -hmm. pine trees. Mm -hmm. Wow. Elizabeth tells me that to get a sense of how much lime was used by the city, I'll have to make some lime mortar myself. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all. Wow, it feels as hot. Well, yeah, because the reaction is very strong and produce heat. Wow, a lot of heat. It's impressive. In order to maintain their Should city, I keep adding water? the yeah. Teotihuacanos plastered and replastered the walls again and again. To do this, they would have probably kept kilns burning around the clock. It's been estimated that they used roughly 30,000 tons of wood each year to build and maintain the plaster on the city. That's about 3,000 acres of forest cut down and burnt each year over centuries. It's as if they were smearing their forests all over their walls. The forests never recovered from this abuse. Neither did the city. The resulting soil erosion slashed farm productivity, setting the stage for crisis. Scientists believe that during the final days of Teotihuacan, pine forests, like this one, were almost completely wiped out. At the same time, the city began to spiral out of control. Was environmental degradation caused by humans the real reason the city of the gods collapsed? What was the final straw? Once again, the answers may lie in the graves. Mike is taking me to a grave in one of the apartment complexes. Apparently, Teotihuacanos frequently buried their relatives right in their own courtyard. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Huh. Yeah, it's, it's been excavated by the archaeologists and, and then, then they resealed it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've already seen the graves of elite soldiers, sacrificed with riches to the gods. Now Mike wants to show me what archaeologists found in the graves of average citizens. So this is a kind of material that was found in graves. And you can see it's a sort of reflection of the wealth of Teotihuacan. You've got green stone, you've got marine shell, you've got coral, all of this coming in from some distance away. These may not look like much to you and me, but these objects were treasured by the people of Teotihuacan. 
the kind of things you'd bury with a loved one. For centuries, people knew they'd take some of these things with them to their graves. But all that changed as the forests got depleted. Wow, so these types of items were found in graves like that? Yes. Uh -huh. Throughout Teotihuacan? Well, uh, not entirely. They were in the earlier years of Teotihuacan. Uh, this wealth seemed to flow fairly freely throughout the city. Some people had less than others, but everybody had some. And then that changed? In the later years, yes. Uh, that kind of material would be found only in the graves of the richer people toward the center of the city. So we're seeing a polarization of the wealth There's classes. a growing gap between the upper class and the lower classes. So it sounds like something is changing internally at Teotihuacan. Uh, something's going drastically wrong in the last century or so. What environmental factors? Once again, it's the teeth that tell the story. Well, uh, we examined the teeth and we were able to see these lines of growth interruption in their teeth and those increased late in the uh, apartment compound history so that uh, people were apparently suffering a lot of episodes of growth interruption, which means episodes of infection, malnutrition, perhaps trauma. Yeah. Teotihuacan, it seems, had gotten too big to sustain itself. With the forests depleted, the farmlands insufficient to sustain the dense urban population the city was literally crumbling under its own pressure. But did people just abandon it and migrate elsewhere? I head back to Linda Manzanilla to put the final pieces together. She has startling new evidence that the city was deliberately burned. On the top we have excavated them and we see the burning of the city around 550 AD. These mounds are the remains of Teotihuacan's administrative center still in the early stages of excavation. So this is what it looks like before archaeologists right. clean it all up. Right. This is how the These tarps are, are here to protect some of the most important archaeological evidence yet discovered at Teo. For example, you see here the stucco floors mm -hmm. originally were white, and oh. you have Black. the ceiling collapsing, and uh, the beams are burning and falling. That's what this says to an archaeologist. You yes. can tell by looking at this floor. Because to me, I can see the discolorations here. Yes. But you're saying that 1,500 years ago, a ceiling collapsed on fire and fell here. Well, I knew you were going to ask that, and I brought a sample of the carbonized wood. Of the when excavations began here in the early 90s, Linda's team found the charred remains of massive roof beams littering the floor, as if from a great fire. A fire that marked the end of a civilization. Carbonized wood is fragile, so Linda has brought only this tiny sample. The rest has been removed and carefully tested to determine the date of the fire. So we have the dates of the construction of the white part and mm -hmm. then the dates of the fall with the black part. Why does this fire say internal revolt and not just wildfire came through and burned everything? Because the, the fire was selective particularly in the temples and the places where the rulers and the decision-making was made. Uh, so a wildfire, if it did come in and burn, would have burned everything, everything indiscriminately. Everything on the site, right. For centuries, Teotihuacan's rulers dominated every aspect of life, even demanding the ultimate sacrifice. In return, they promised to bless and protect the people. When these promises fell flat, it seems the people exacted the perfect revenge on their masters and their monuments. It was a no-confidence vote on the existing power structure, carried out on an unsurpassed scale. Overnight, this magnificent metropolis that dominated the region for centuries was reduced to a shadow of its former self, never to rise again. A civilization that thrived on order collapsed in chaos.
This week, join me as I explore the rise and fall of central Mexico's city of the gods, Teotihuacan, a metropolis of mega proportions that thrived for centuries, then mysteriously collapsed. Who built Teotihuacan and what happened to them? To find out, I float above the ruins, play one of the world's oldest sports, make razor-sharp tools with volcanic glass, and learn about one man whose bones become my window into the past. It's a search for answers to one of history's great enigmas. We're digging for the truth, and we're going to extremes to do it. Like butter. These are the ruins of Teotihuacan. At one point, this was a thriving cultural center. Some believe this was the first great city of the Western Hemisphere. But after centuries of dominance, it suddenly collapsed. Its inhabitants left us no readable documents to explain why. Just their monuments, their art, and their graves. Hi, I'm Josh Bernstein, and I've come here to central Mexico to explore the fate of this city's people. And there's no better place to start than with the ruins of the city itself. Pyramids dominate the city skyline. Today, three major ones still stand. But in the past, as many as 200 smaller pyramids, all just a few feet from each other, dotted the city. Construction started in the first century AD. At its height, around 450 AD, almost 150,000 people lived here, in specially designed apartment complexes. The city stretched out for some 20 square miles, making it one of the ancient world's largest cities. Then, sometime after 